Richard, it's always a pleasure to have you in Springfield. Um, tell us, what does the Rhodes Professor of American History at Oxford do? <laughs> the Rhodes Professor of American History at Oxford, well, it's an interesting position. Um, I don't think Oxford really knows necessarily what to do with its professors. Um, I'm not disparaging my institution by saying that. Um, the key history teachers in Oxford are the college tutors. The college tutors who will teach across a range of courses. There'll be perhaps two or three tutors per college. And they teach undergraduates, um, three-year undergraduate degree. They also supervise graduate studies. The professors, the named professors in Oxford, do very little undergraduate teaching. They date back to a time when subjects outside the mainstream, outside the British and European mainstream, were seen as needed to be covered, but uh, the college tutors could not be relied upon or depended upon to, to cover those areas. So that the Rhodes Professor, which was established in Oxford very recently in the early 1970s, was an attempt to create um, a permanent present in Oxford for American history at a time when the college tutors in the 30 or 40 colleges um, were not specialists in American history and where the colleges would not want to point, uh, point uh, a specialist in American history. So the Rose Professor's role has evolved since the early 1970s. At that stage it was essentially a research chair with uh, a certain amount of lecturing to undergraduates and graduates but with no um, tutorial teaching no marking of essays, mm -hmm. um, the occasional class. Over the years, it has become a chair, and certainly in my time, it's become a chair in which we've sought to develop American history as not simply a substantial undergraduate subject, but as a, an important subject at the graduate level. And we now run master's courses and research degrees in American history. Uh, to the extent that I think we can say, I don't want to sound immodest, but I think we can say we have probably the, uh, the program in American history which is une un unsurpassed outside the United States. I wouldn't say it's unequaled, um, but I would say it's unsurpassed. And my d usual week would be, when in term time, would be a number of graduate supervisions. I would certainly be running uh, a seminar or two. I'd be giving the occasional lecture. Um, I'd be attending innumerable committee meetings. Um, so one of my colleagues said, uh, no one ever said on their deathbed, I wish I'd been to more committee meetings, but this is the <laughs> price you have to pay for being uh, a representative, the, the, the chief representative of your subject mm -hmm. within the larger historical community. So when I say Oxford doesn't quite know what to do with its professors, what I think I mean is that professors in Oxford have had a role which has evolved over the years. And we now play really a, a rather bigger part, I think, in administration uh, and in the graduate development of graduate studies within the subject. So how did your own interest veer toward American history and specifically Lincoln and yes. the Civil War yes, era? Yeah. Well, when I went to Oxford as an undergraduate back in the mid-60s, um, there were compulsory courses on British history, as they put it, from the beginning <laughs> until 1945, which was thought to be as as close to the present as you should properly come. Uh, there were also two papers on uh, two courses on European history. And in one's final year, one was allowed to break out from this rather narrow uh, syllabus. But not having, uh, not having a language, at least not being so competent in a language that I felt I could master the sources, I was drawn to, uh, to American history as something that was other, something that was foreign. Um, but also something that I felt I could master in terms of the sources. And I took a course, Slavery and Secession, 1850-1861, which had been established by Alan Nevins when he was Harmsworth professor back in the late 1940s. It was a hugely successful and popular course and I need a number of um, American historians of my generation, and indeed a little earlier, uh, cut their teeth, really, on that slavery and secession special subject. And it was an, uh, a complete eye-opener for me. I, I'd, I'd come, I wouldn't say I had come to American history in a patronizing way. I was 
uh, I come from South Wales. Um, we had many American connections in South Wales, so America was a, was a, a subject of real interest for me. But there was certainly a patronizing attitude towards American history in Oxford at that time amongst historians. If you were not a medievalist or an early modernist, if you hadn't mastered Latin, uh, then somehow uh, you, know, you, you were only a second-rate historian. That you were interested in a second-rate kind of history. And what I discovered, of course, with uh, r reading the huge number of primary sources that were requisite for this particular course, which Alan Nevins had, had selected, and reading the wonderful historiography of the Civil War era, the coming of the Civil War era, um, a historiography, historiography that, of course, has gone on developing marvelously since then, but nonetheless, in the, in the 1960s, already um, a, a, a glorious historiography. Um, I, I was completely converted. I just I thought this was a wonderful subject. Um, and when the chance came to pursue this at graduate level uh, after my finals, um, that's, that's what I did. My, Final year in Oxford with this, the third year with this special subject coincided with Don Farrenbacher's tenure of the Harmsworth chair. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just say a word about the Harmsworth chair, and um, maybe just a little historical uh, explanation here. Back in the 19th century, Cambridge University in England had been offered money, I think by Harvard, but certainly offered an opportunity to establish a chair in American history. And the people at Cambridge turned it down on the grounds that this was a very too radical a subject. It was too dangerous a subject to be taught <laughs> in one of the ancient universities. Move on 60 years to the 1920s at a time when America was no longer regarded as quite this <laughs> revolutionary radical, um, and r not radical in quite the, sa in the same way anyway. Um, in the 1920s, uh, in the aftermath of the Great War of 1914 to 18, with uh, European ruins, with uh, dictatorships springing up um, across mm -hmm. the continent, there was a very strong sense of Anglo-American connectedness and the significance of these of the of the, of the North Atlantic in the defence of, uh, of, of of democratic government. And at, that was the time that the Harmsworth Chair in American History was established in Oxford. It was funded by the, the Rothermere Publishing family. Uh, it was part, I think, of a much larger Anglo-American um, rapprochement, I think would be, the, would be a fair term, and certainly coming out of the alliance of, during the First World War. Uh, in other words, the 19th century uh, difficult relationship between the United States and Britain, giving way to a sense of a common Anglo-Saxon purpose to yeah. save the world for democracy in the Wilsonian, in the Wilsonian moment. That Harmsworth chair was the spine, really, or the hook on which American history was hung right through to the 1960s when the Rhodes chair, late 60s, when early 70s when the Rhodes chair was established. And increasingly the holder of that Harmsworth chair uh, played a significant role in undergraduate teaching. I think in the early days, um, Samuel Elliott Mo Morrison was one of the mm -hmm. early Harmsworths. He effectively had a five-year research chair. Mm -hmm. But by the 1950s and 60s, when Nevins and Kenneth Stamp and, uh, and others held this distinguished figures. David uh, Potter. Uh, David Potter, one. yeah. Um, Don Farnbacher was the Harmsworth in, in my year. Um, I, I didn't attend any of his classes. I wasn't able to attend any of his classes. I was in a different group, but I did go to his lectures. Yeah. And, uh, and we did talk. He and I did, did talk. And uh, after my finals, when it was clear that I had a good enough outcome to uh, be funded for research, uh, I, um, I'm I went after my final examination. It's a, the, the, the examination system in Oxford is, an orde is, a, is a complete ordeal. Oh, it was in those days. I had to take uh, two three-hour papers a day uh, for five and a half days, 11 papers, with just the break for the Sunday. So it's a physical as well as an emotional ordeal. And commonly in Oxford, at the end of your, exam at the end of your examination, you go to your college and you open a bottle of fizz. Uh, champagne and you celebrate and the, f the cares of the world fall off your shoulders. Well, in s I didn't go to my college, I actually went to the nearest college because <laughs> my girlfriend had a friend in that college and we thought the, 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 the sooner we could open this bottle the better. And opening the bottle on Queen's College lawn 
my undergraduate uh, one of my undergraduate tutors came along. I had tutors with Kenneth Morgan at, of Queens, and he said, "What are you doing here?" Not mean in any aggressive way, but you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> no, I said, "Well, you know, celebrate the end of finals." He said, "But you know, what are you doing next?" Well, I said, I'm, "I'm hoping to do some research in American history." He said, "Well, why didn't you apply for this uh, scholarship at, at Queens, senior scholarship at Queens?" Um, oh, I said, "I didn't realize that I was eligible." Oh, yes, I said, "Thank you. You should come on Monday to be interviewed." Well, I think the situation was they'd had no applicants, actually. But anyway, <laughs> I, went, I went on Monday to be interviewed by Kenneth Morgan and Donna Fahrenbacher. And uh, uh, Fahrenbacher very gently asked me what it was that I was looking to do by way of research. And I said, I really wanted to do some work on public opinion during the 1850s. Mm -hmm. And that got us into a discussion about, uh, he said, well, how would you determine public opinion? So I said, oh, newspapers. <laughs> That got us into a discussion about the nature of newspapers and how, of course, they are party sheets and they mm -hmm. don't necessarily represent a uh, sig significant, they, they don't have, the, sorry, start again, they can represent a significant body of opinion, but it's very difficult to measure the dimensions right. of that body of opinion. Um, well, that, this is a very long way of saying how did I become an American historian. Um, Partly because I think I came from South Wales, where there were strong American connections. I had an interest in American culture. I had distant relations who lived in the United States. I had a visiting American aunt, so-called aunt, she wasn't in fact a blood relative, who came every summer to spend time in, in Wales. Uh, she spent the rest of her time on the Gulf Coast. So we, we had conversations about the United States. Um, th th so there was a personal background. There was also just the, um, the sheer joy of discovering this, uh, this history that seemed to be so rich and so historiographically co combative. I think it was the, I think it was the, the combativeness of the, the historical writings that I enjoyed so much, and by, by which I mean the historians as well as the players. Um, and, uh, you know, so much of life is chance as well as choice. Uh, in the late 1960s, there was money to do research in history. Uh, well-funded scholarships, and I got a, I got um, a state award, which meant I had three three years in Oxford in res doing research, one year in Berkeley, mm -hmm. um, funded by the Queen's scholarship that I that I'd mentioned that Don Farnbacher had uh, uh, had helped uh, helped place me uh, place me in, and so I went off to Berkeley in 1969-1970, which was not the, the most quiet of times on that <laughs> campus. <laughs> it was a historical <laughs> experience in itself. And I completed my uh, term as a research student without completing my doctorate. My doctorate was still uh, embryonic mm -hmm. when I got a post uh, advertised at the University of Sheffield. And the rest, as they say, is history. But you, you kept up that, that interest in the, the transatlantic connection. Uh, your early yeah. work dealt with Abolitionism yeah. and yes. evangelicals yes. and yes. the transatlantic yeah. connection. You want to describe it because then yeah. that segues into yeah. Lincoln. Yeah. It does. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, <coughs> what Oxford uh, was especially good at was uh, many things in history, but w one thing it was especially good at was um, introducing undergraduates to the history of religion. Um, not from a partisan perspective, but just seeing it as part of this on the seamless web of the past. Um, and my American history tutor, um, who taught the slavery into special tutorials, was an 18th century historian, historian of 18th century Methodism. And he rather, he was a lovely, saintly, is a lovely, saintly man, um, a wonderful teacher. Um, when I went to talk to him about working on American reform in the antebellum years, particularly anti-slavery reform, he kindly took me on. He said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take you. I'm an amateur, but I'll take you on initially, and we'll see if we can place you with someone who will be more appropriate. Because as I delved into the reform movements of antebell the antebellum years, the more clear it became that religion was a part of this story. And the more I became aware of my own blinkeredness in respect of religion, religious history, and um, that there were there was there was a story there to be to be pursued. Who better than a historian of 18th and 19th century British Methodism to help me into um, that world? And my tutor had spent time in the United States, and he had an interest in American religion. And it was he who said, "Well, if you 
when it became clear to me that transatlantic reform really was as, as much a story of transatlantic religion that he uh, suggested the subject of the connections between um, a rev the revivalistic form of evangelicalism that mm -hmm. flourished um, from the late 18th century onwards in, in uh, well actually earlier in the United States, but a particular form of almost modern revivalism which develops in the early years of the 19th century. And of course there's, there's a significant amount of toing and froing across the Atlantic in those years of uh, the early 1800s through indeed throughout the 19th century. And uh, my, so my doctorate, which then became the first book on transatlantic revivalism, was a study of the work of such figures as uh, Charles Finney, Lorenzo Dahl, um, on both sides of the Atlantic, but, and then looking, uh, using them as a way of comparing uh, religious societies and the place of religion in societies in Britain with a state church where evangelical influences are more moderate and where, <coughs> where the pluralism of sects is nothing like what it is in the United States and the United States where this establishment creates a very different sort of religious culture. That um, led me um, for my next book into the relationship between that uh, very influential uh, evangelical culture, subculture in the United States and the, the politics of the antebellum years from the 1830s through to um, the outbreak of the Civil War. So that when it came to looking at Lincoln, and, and there's a story there is about why, how, I, how I came to, 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 to work on Lincoln, it seemed to me that uh, the placing Lincoln uh, into that political culture, which I saw as being shaped in quite profound ways by the larger religious milieu, um, it seemed to be that placing Lincoln into that context mm -hmm. uh, would be a way of exploring Lincoln that gave a certain freshness to the story without being factitious or distorting, uh, distorting the, t the story. Um, we, we know that uh, um, Lincoln has been claimed by pretty well every religious tradition mm -hmm. <laughs> and has been turned, he's a, he's a protean figure who be, can be turned to uh, a denominational advantage as it were. Uh, well that wasn't my my purpose clearly it was to uh, uh, attempt to to honor Lincoln's uh, unorthodox religious beliefs I think there were there was a faith there but it's an evolving faith and a rather unorthodox faith but to but to place him and um, his the, the morality that, 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 that accompanies that faith, the political morality that accompanies that faith, in the, the, the larger context of a society in which evangelical Protestantism is the dominant religious mode. Mm -hmm. Now that book, uh, your biography of Lincoln, won a Lincoln Prize, mm -hmm. and you are now being honored by the Order of Lincoln. Yes. I'm wondering, as kind of a two-part question here before we close, and first, what does that mean to you, I mean, what, what are your thoughts about being honored in that way? And then, in this bicentennial year of Lincoln's birth, what what does Lincoln ha still have to say? What you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I, I'll try and keep my remarks short because I, there's, an, there's a lot I could say in response to both of those questions. I never ever expected to become a Lincoln expert or a writer on Lincoln and certainly having written on Lincoln I never expected to win the Lincoln Prize or to become honored uh, as I uh, as I have been with the Order of Lincoln um, and at times I still have to pinch myself to believe that this is this is the case um, it's not a false modesty. I, I wrote the book on Lincoln believing I had something fresh to say, but certainly not seeing myself as any great Lincoln scholar. Um, um, winning the Lincoln Prize came straight right out of the blue. I had to sit down <laughs> to take the news when it came across the, the transatlantic telephone. Um, and uh, it, it's been a wonderful, it was a wonderful, a wonderful development for me. It, meant the last few years have been rather different. I think the combination of winning the Lincoln Prize and the build-up to the bicentennial mm -hmm. has meant that I've, I've not been able to shake myself free of Lincoln. I often say jokingly to people that Lincoln is the great emancipator, but actually he shackled me for five years longer than I expected to be shackled. It's a very pleasant form of slavery, it has to be said. But, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so to, to be honored by the 
Lincoln Academy of Illinois, um, the state to which I have made more visits than any other. I won't say I've spent more time here than any other state because I have spent a, an extended time in California and Syracuse, New York and North Carolina, but cumulatively my visits to Illinois would, would, would begin to match those. But I've returned to Illinois many times in recent years. I first came, I think, back in 1981, and it's a state for which I have terrific affection. Um, I do feel very much a home in the Midwest, actually. It's just a, there's an honesty and a warmth uh, about the, the, the heartland, this, this heartland of America that I find very attractive. And I have, uh, I have very, very good friends here. So w w to be honored w with the, this laureate, the, the, uh, the Order of Lincoln, uh, is, is wonderful. I mean, it's quite, quite, quite wonderful. And uh, my great, great regret is that uh, my parents didn't live to, to see it. My, my mother was always, who died um, seven years ago, uh, knew that I was writing the book on Lincoln. In fact, she was saying, when are you going to finish that book on Lincoln? It's about <laughs> the only book of yours I'll be able to read, <laughs> or want to read. <laughs> and uh, so it's a great sadness that um, she missed the, the publication of the book and the uh, the honor that followed it, and she certainly would have have just been overjoyed um, and would probably have been here for, for this uh, for this ceremony. My father um, too, um, was, who is a historian as a uh, high school teacher, um, I would have um, would have been stunned by this and really pleased we We have on in, in our family um, our, we go back to um, the late nineteenth century. Uh, uh, when my father's family waved off to America, um, the Lewis family, uh, one of whose um, children, uh, John L. Lewis, became the, the great uh, miners' leader. Uh, so, uh, so there are all sorts of ways, I think, in, in, in which this um, honoring by the, the state of Illinois uh, is just a marvelous, marvelous thing. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm just enormously grateful to Mr. Lincoln <laughs> and to my friends in Illinois, of whom, of course, I count you, Tom, as, as one of the best. You've been uh, such a support to me. Uh, when I, f I remember arriving here in 1994 as a, as a fledgling Lincolnian um, and uh, just being uh, every moment along the way since then, you've been such a, a, um, such a, su such a support. What does Lincoln what does Lincoln, I think the second part of your question, what does Lincoln mean to me? Uh, what, uh, what, yeah. You know, I mean, the yeah. fellow 200 years old, yeah. what, 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 it gets to this whole point of commemoration and, yes. and yes. Yes. why do we still do it? Why that? do we still do it? It's a fascinating question. And of course, um, it's not just here in the United States. I mean, uh, the, uh, Lincoln, what is, you, you will be able to answer better than I what it is that uh, Abraham Lincoln means to, um, to Americans outside the Old South, perhaps I should say, outside the Old White South, <laughs> you <Yeah>. say. <laughs> um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that those, those, uh, um, those, uh, those icebergs are melting uh, and those walls are being broken down um, in, in, at the beginning of a, of a, of a new century and in a, in a, under a president who um, represent something new and who represent something very Lincolnian actually in terms of uh, honoring the, uh, uh, the, the e e opening the path as it were to uh, ability and to talent regardless of race and creed. Uh, but what does Lincoln mean for, um, for the rest of the world? I think at different times and in different places Lincoln has meant so much and other times so little. Uh, if I look at um, if I look at Lincoln's standing in in Britain in recent years, um, it doesn't bear any real comparison to the century ago, um, seventy five years ago, when there was something approaching a cult of Lincoln in in Britain. Uh, Lincoln's centenary was marked. Perhaps the first really great modern biography of Lincoln was John Wood's biography of nineteen sixteen. Very influential. Uh, Lincoln statue in Parliament Square, mm -hmm. 1920. Lloyd George, great admirer of Lincoln. 
Churchill, Second World War admirer of Lincoln. Lincoln's name crops up in parliamentary debates in the 1940s with as much frequency as it did during the, the First World War. These are the, mm -hmm. the peaks of Lincoln's, of attention to Lincoln. But just a few years ago, I think it was you who pointed me to this poll in the London Times. Um, the inhabitant of Springfield, who was most famous in the United Kingdom, uh, was Homer Simpson, yes. uh, not Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> uh, Lincoln came w well down that, uh, that listing. Um, now, that doesn't mean that, that Lincoln doesn't have anything to say, and indeed, it should be said that the bicentennial is being marked uh, in, in Britain, but, but not as marked, of course, as Charles Darwin, born on the same day. Mm -hmm. So the attention in Britain over the last few weeks has been almost exclusively on Darwin. There will be some events um, on the birthday um, and immediately preceding and after the birthday, and we have a big conference in Oxford in the summer in July on Lincoln's global legacy. What I think Lincoln means for, well, I know what it means for me, and what I think he means for quite a number of us in, in Britain, is this uh, remarkable fusion of a, a moral compass, someone who has a set of values and a moral determination and a moral, a moral task, um, which was to uh, b broadly, I mean, the, 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 the destruction of slavery is part of a larger program, a larger vision of a society where everyone can enjoy the fruits of their own labor uh, and can be upwardly socially mobile. Mm -hmm. That, I think, it's a, merit, uh, it's a meritocratic vision. And, and what I think is remarkable in Lincoln, it's, or it's what makes him so attractive, it's not unique, but it's his, 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 he brings together a, a, a variety of attributes which I think do make him unique. It's this combination of the moral vision without the, the, uh, without the, the demagoguery or the emotional finger tone, wagging. <laughs> that the finger wagging, yeah. um, with this reliance on, this profound faith in the reason of the common man, and he would have said man, uh, that if you educate people, if you give them the truth, tell them the truth, he said during the, uh, during the Civil War, tell the people the truth and the country is safe. Mm -hmm. um, this formidable, uh, hugely impressive reliance on faith in the wisdom and judgment of um, the, 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 be the better angels of human nature. Um, and uh, I challenge anybody, any critic of Lincoln, to go back to Lincoln's writings, his political writings, and not to come away with a sense of moral purpose and the political skill to bring that moral purpose to fruition uh, in a, uh, using a language and a tone of voice that is ultimately rational and not emotional. And I find that enormously attractive. Coming as I do from South Wales, where the, the nonconformist <laughs> preacher <laughs> had a very moral vision, but was not always appealing to the most rational of instincts, yeah. I, I, I pr appreciate Lincoln, as it were, all the more. Well, Richard, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.